So we're in the midst of our worship and stewardship series uh, about our life together. And we've been reading a, a foundational scripture each of these weeks uh, from Acts chapter 2, the end of that chapter, which is really a summary statement about what life was like among the believers after Jesus' resurrection. We're going to be reading that again, but we're actually going to step back a little bit, read a little bit leading into that uh, this time so that we can hear what it is um, that, that God uh, was doing in their midst. So uh, just to set the scene... Uh, it's Pentecost, which was, you know, it's a it's a, a special celebration for us as Christians. But before that, Pentecost uh, has been a, a special celebration for our Jewish brothers and sisters. And so there was this Pentecost celebration happening in Jerusalem. That's when the Lord God poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit upon these uh, followers of Jesus there. And, and the gift of the Spirit caused such a commotion that a cosmopolitan crowd gathered to see what was going on. And, and it's in that moment that the Apostle... Peter stepped up and preached to the crowd. And, and this is the end of that. He ends with these words. Hear these words now. Peter said, Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you dream? When you sleep, do you dream? What do you dream about? There are some very common dreams that people have. Of course, there's that dream of flying. It's a favorite. You know, you dream about flying. There's also that dream where you're either standing in your underwear or even naked in front of a group of people. That's not such a great dream. There's that dream where you're being chased and you can't run. Your legs are so heavy and you just can't move. There's many dreams in the Bible. And most of them are accompanied with great risk. The prophet Isaiah had a dream, a dream of good news for the oppressed and the brokenhearted, the captive. It was a, a dream of a better life for God's people who had been carried off out of the promised land in, into exile. And when we go back into the Psalms and we see uh, uh, Psalm 126, that's probably what they were referring to. That's what they were singing about in Psalm 126. It's a, it's a worship song, and it was used when the people were journeying up to the temple. It was literally on a higher elevation. They would journey up to the temple. And uh, as they were going up to the temple in Jerusalem, they sang about the wonderful things that God had done for them. And of course, one of the best was when the Lord God brought the exiled people back home. See, the Israelites, they had suffered this sort of calamity, this utter defeat and destruction at the hands of the Babylonians, and their lives were terrible after that. They'd literally been stolen from their homes, and they didn't have their stuff, and they were slaves to the Babylonians, and they were oppressed. I mean, life was bad. It was terrible. But the Lord God then restored them to their lives and their homes and to the temple in Jerusalem. And so they just cried with joy. They were overwhelmed. There was this awe that they felt on their way to worship at the temple again. And so in Psalm 126, we hear this. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues were filled with shouts of joy. And then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are overjoyed. It's a wonderful Psalm. The Lord has done great things for us. And this is what the Apostle Peter 
preached after Jesus' resurrection, well, after his crucifixion and his resurrection, and then the ascension, and then the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus' followers. And when the Holy Spirit came upon the believers, it caused such a commotion that it drew this sort of cosmopolitan crowd together, people who had come from nations all over coming for the Feast of, of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And Peter told them, about the great things that the Lord had done. He called Jesus Lord. He called Jesus Messiah. That is, he was saying Jesus is God and Jesus is the anointed one, the agent of salvation. And this cosmopolitan crowd that was gathered there listening to Peter, they were cut to the heart. It's a great line in scripture. They were cut to the heart. And so they asked what they should do. See, Peter's witness, his preaching, his telling the story of Jesus and what God had done, it evoked a powerful response from those who had gathered there. What should they do? And Peter told them to repent, to be baptized, to receive the Holy Spirit. That is, he was saying to them, so, so change your mind and your behavior. That's what repent is. It's, it, it means literally turn away. You know, turn away from what you're doing that's taking you away from the Lord God. And, and turn to the Lord. That's what repent means. Turn away from that and turn to the Lord. And, and be baptized, initiated into this community of, of Christians. And receive this new life, this new power in God's Holy Spirit. Because it's a gift not just for the Jews gathered in Jerusalem or even the Jews from around the world. But even for the, the Gentile non-Jewish persons from all around the world as well. Remember this was this sort of cosmopolitan crowd that had rushed forward to see what the commotion was when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon Jesus' followers. And they welcomed this message. And they repented and they were baptized. And then we hear, that day, about 3,000 persons were added to the small band of Christians there in Jerusalem. 3,000 persons. All right, do you know how many people, that is, how many Christians, how many Jesus followers were there to begin with? 120. 120. There were 120 people there after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. I mean, like, you know, we read the Gospels and we see there was, there was up and down in the number of people. I mean, there were crowds sometimes, thousands and thousands of people. But in the end, after it was all said and done, after the crucifixion and then Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, there were 120 people who made up the believers, the family of, of Christians, so to speak. 120 people waiting there, as Jesus told them, to to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So one morning, <laughs> about nine days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt 120 of his followers. And then by that evening, by that evening, 3,000 devout Jews and proselytes had joined with them. And most of those newcomers, they had traveled to Jerusalem for Pentecost, but many decided to stay right there to learn more about Jesus and to be a part of, of this, this revolution, this phenomenon that we now call the church. They started with 120. And then because of what the Lord did, there was a great conversion of 3,000 people in a single moment. And they, the 120 and the 3,000, they were filled with awe. This is what our scripture then says. All of them, the 120 and the 3,000, they've come together. They were filled with awe at what the Lord God had done through them and was doing with them. They were filled with awe, with wonder and amazement and astonishment and reverence and even fear, right? Because it was so overwhelming and it was out of their control. And day by day, the Lord added to their number. We're building a new ministry center and it's going to be a wonderful tool but we're doing more than that we're building up the church that is this gathering of people whether we're all together uh, uh, in person or online here or off in smaller groups or even on our own wherever we are but but together we are the church and and we are reaching out to our community and I find it interesting, 
I wonder if you know what our average in-person attendance is these days. <laughs> it's about 120. It's actually a little even bit less than that right now, but it's going to probably come back up now before the end of the year. I don't know about you, but, but I dream about the great things that the Lord has done and is doing and will continue to do. And, and we are in awe because of it. And day by day, the Lord continues to add to our number. No, we, we don't have 3,000 people, but you never know what God will do in a single moment, because that's all it is, in a single moment, in this one moment. We will be in awe of what the Lord God does. But mostly, though, I, I think more than just those single moments, then there are some single moments, but more than that, God seems to, to move steadily over the course of time. I mean, after all, what brings us to our celebration today, and, and we are celebrating in person, you know, out at the Country Lane Lodge, what, what brings us to this celebration today started more than 150 years ago when a radical circuit preacher, uh, the Reverend William Busick, preached and organized a small class. And over time, that led to a, a church in Waukee. And, and they held their worship services in several locations, in the old Des Moines Valley Depot, and then later in the Presbyterian Church, and still later, get this, at the schoolhouse. 150 years ago, they were holding worship services at the schoolhouse. That's an amazing thing. And the first church building that, that we had was completed in 1878. And 100 years after that, in 1978, we built a new church building right next door. But in 2006, our congregation, we had this vision to move into a different part of Waukee and, and uh, do something new. And we purchased 27 acres of land along what's now L.A. Grant Parkway. And it was $38,000 for each of those acres. So it was a $1 million land purchase. And, and we were land banking. That is, so you know, we bought 27 acres, but we were intending to, to sell off 17 of those acres to help us with our, our building project on the remaining 10. And, and it, was a good, it was a good plan, right? I mean, developers were lined up, Waukee was exploding, and all kinds of, of construction was happening, except that then 2008 hit, and the financial downturn, uh, including the, the housing crash and the housing crisis, and the developers, you know, they all stepped back. And as a congregation, we lost $250,000 uh, on this on that deal. So, so we got busy with a capital campaign, raising money to pay off the land. And, and I understand there was a wonderful miracle Sunday that paid off, you know, the remaining amount. It was a powerful time. And then after that, after the land was paid off, we, we had a, a capital campaign in which we put a million dollars in the bank. And then after that, we did another capital campaign. That was last year, the, the first part of last year, in which we uh, are raising another million dollars plus. And then we sold that 1978 building at 650 Ashworth, and, and we thought we were going to maybe get three hundred dollars or $400,000 for it, but, but it was kind of the height of the, the market when we sold, and so we sold for $1.4 million dollars. And 150 years after we were meeting in a school, we're meeting in a school again, 150 years later, right? It's a pretty amazing thing. And, uh, and new people are joining with us. And the Lord is adding to our number. And when new people come, they bring sort of wonderful gifts that that they possess and wonderful connections that they have, wonderful, wonderful people and astonishing connections. And so uh, between this year and next year, we are uh, receiving $500,000 from the Dahl Trust for our new ministry center. And we are astonished. We are in awe. And, and then we broke ground in March and we've been watching that new ministry center rise. I mean, over and over and over, we have been in awe. We've been amazed at what the Lord our God has done. I mean, can you even imagine what God has done over the last 150 years? What God has done with, with us. 
the previous us and, and, the, and in the lives of the people and, and in this community what the Lord God has done and what God is doing now and, and where the Lord has brought us. I mean, as Cindy Craigmile, our financial controller and, and capital campaign director says, I mean, anytime we seem to hit a roadblock, it just, it just seemed to disappear. It seemed to go away as people stepped up as the church. And we are in awe of what God is doing through us because God is awesome. Now we're hoping to move into our new ministry center sometime during the first part of 2023 and we'll do a soft launch which means you know we'll just we'll we'll take ourselves in and begin meeting and working out the the bugs in the new facility and then we'll probably have a a big grand opening sometime around easter time but we'll just keep reaching out to the community and sharing what god has done and forming people together in the way of jesus so that so that we're a people who you know love god and love their neighbor and think and act like jesus and we'll just see what happens what the lord god does as as day by day the lord god continues to work in and among and through us and brings new people into our midst. It, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting to experience the awe that we feel for all that the Lord God has done and to think about what, what God will do with us. I mean, in a single moment, there was a conversion of 3,000 people in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost. I mean, what, what will God do with us? How many people will be reached and 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 what amazing wonders and healings and miracles and changed lives will happen as people respond to us sharing what the Lord God has done and, and what God has done in Jesus and how God is active in the power of the Holy Spirit we and we celebrate today all that God has done but, but we're not just remember, remembering the glory days we're not just remembering the past we're calling on God to come once more and again do great things that leave us in awe. And it's not too much to ask of our God. C.S. Lewis, the British writer and, and academic, uh, once said that our greatest human problem is not that we ask too much out of life, but rather that we seem to expect too little. C.S. Lewis says, it's not that we're asking for too much. We seem to expect too, too little. We're far too easily pleased. Lewis said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're, we're these half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. And so like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. 20 years ago, my wife Joy and I, we were in Houston with a group of church planters. And one of the things that we heard over and, and over was this, you just cannot dream too big. You cannot expect too much with God. And the church planters, they said that whether they were starting a ministry, whether they were whether building a church, whatever it was, they almost always, they didn't dream big enough because our God is an awesome God and when and when God acts it leaves us in awe the Lord has done great things for us thanks be to God